All right. So uh, this is um, this is a bit off topic. I can see people fleeing. It's, uh, so uh, actually, so it was uh, quite coincidental that I, I was very delighted to receive a message from John Arnaud, who was apparently very intrigued that low Rossby number convection is uh, prevalent in the sun. So let me introduce you to it. So this is uh, this is the causal chain and the reasons why we study convection. Um, so uh, you know, there are all these, uh, the, f the reasons for the physics uh, is, is apparent, uh, there are these things, but uh, in terms of the phenomenon, in terms of solar phenomena, uh, convection ostensibly drives these large scale fluid circulations. Uh, the sun is almost a solid body rotator, which in itself is a remarkable thing. And so there's differential rotation of the outer convection zone and there's a large scale meridional circulation. And contemporary theories of dynamo action in the sun rely on these two primary circulations to uh, create large-scale magnetic fields, which in turn affects Earth climate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this causal chain is, uh, is uh, I, I think, quite solid. But um, the, the important thing to, do, uh, to, uh, to be aware of is that convection is, is very poorly understood, especially in, this, uh, in the regime that is astrophysics, or almost actually most other regimes that are natural. So if, if you were to, uh, so we have uh, numerous satellites and ground-based instruments that look at the sun. And uh, the, the observations themselves are really quite remarkable. Uh, very high quality, very high resolution. This is in particular is taken by the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager. So this is a satellite that's uh, you know, sort of looking at the surface of the sun. You see this mean gradient. It's in Doppler velocity, but you see a mean gradient. This is bright here and dark on this side. That's the rotation of the sun itself. Uh, and uh, so if you were to just look at this, the disk of the sun, you see uh, granularity sort of uh, uh, strikes you, and that is supergranulation. So this, each of these whatever little things that you see is about 35,000 kilometers, and it's a, we think it's a scale of convection, although it still is an outstanding puzzle as to why this scale of uh, fluid motion arises. So anyway, so it's about 35,000 kilometers. The supergranules dot the surface uniformly, on the, you know, isotropically, essentially and about 300 you know, meters per second horizontal velocity. Now, if you were to take this region, uh, this is actually a sunspot, so I, I didn't mean it to be a red herring, but if, anyway, the, if you were to take any region of the sun and zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and so we have very high resolution, and you see all these dots and stuff happening. And now if you zoom in even more, then you see these little cells. And this is the fundamental unit of thermal transport in the sun. So this is granulation. It's about 1,500 kilometers in size. And uh, it, it transports, uh, uh, you know, essentially granules dot the surface of the sun, and they transport a solar luminosity outwards. Uh, and so what we're really interested in understanding is what happens on scales larger, and what, first of all, what is the nature of supergranulation, what happens on larger scales in convection, and what is the nature of convection in the interior of the sun itself. So I would like to point, these, uh, point out these numbers to you. So the Reynolds number, well, uh, you know, sort of uh, determining these numbers itself can be a bit of an art. So how you define them is a bit tricky. But if you were to just take me at, uh, at face value, so the Reynolds number is on the order of 10 to the 16. Anyway, absurdly large numbers or absurdly small numbers. This is uh, the pattern. So the Prandtl number is 10 to the minus 6. Um, in some ways, quite similar, let's say, to, to the Earth's inner core. Uh, so, uh, so numerical simulations, you heard about one, and this is, for instance, the ASH numerical simulation. Um, and so they solve a detailed, uh, you know, the, uh, not, not the full Navier-Stokes, but analastic equations of convection. And so this is, for instance, a uh, snapshot from one of these ASH simulations, fluid in the center transporting heat upwards, and then collapsing on the side in this dark violet, uh, cool, down, down going, descending plumes. But is this, so this predicts, this has a certain set of predictions and it has, a, you know, attendant uh, predictions for the for <laughs> dynamics of the sun itself. And so we, as seismologists, want to test this hypothesis. So we are doing hypothesis testing by determining whether this is indeed what's happening in the sun. So to do this, uh, so now I will move on to what, I'm, I'm actually just a seismologist. Uh, so, so let me tell you what, uh, what we did. So um, we basically take, so, so the data from HMI, the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager, uh, it's, it's a terabyte a day or something, some enormous amounts of data. So it takes 45, every 45 seconds, it takes a 16 million pixel snapshot of the sun. So we have near continuous, I mean, we have continuous seismic monitoring in some sense, near continuous. And uh, so, um, so we used a, a trillion wave field measurements. Uh, we, uh, down, we did lots of analysis, downsampling, uh, huge numbers of cross correlations, and a large number of wave travel times. And uh, so the basic concept is 
you know, waves are sensitive to wave speeds. And so wave speeds, so it's, a, it's like a, it's like a by, you know, they're a proxy. Wave speeds themselves are a proxy for other properties in the interior. So for instance, if you had a flow, and the thing that we're trying to determine here is the structure of convective flows in the interior of the sun, um, is that if, if, you had a wave, if you had a flow that's going from left to right, and a wave that was going in the direction of the flow, the, the wave would be sped up, and so its travel time would be lowered. Uh, whereas if the wave were going in the opposite direction, uh, direction opposite to the flow, then it would be slowed down. So the, waves, wa you know, the wave travel is Doppler shifted in some sense. And so the symmetry is broken of travel time. So the travel times from one to two is not the same. If the travel time from one to two were not to be the same as the travel time from two to one, and that symmetry, the fundamental wave travel time symmetry is broken, then you know there's a flow underneath. So that's how we are essentially measuring the three components of vector flow, or th you know, whatever, the full flow in the sun. And uh, so the imaging is as follows. So we have, as I said, the entire disk, one, the visible disk of the sun is available to us. So we can make a smooth map, essentially, of flows in the interior. And uh, so we take these concentric circles. It's like an aperture that we place at the surface. We measure seismic, uh, we have seismic measurements, essentially, all over this, all, all of these uh, co concentric rings. Uh, the blue and the blue, uh, we cross-correlate these two, and that tells us about flows essentially in this direction. The red and the red tell us about flows in the vertical direction, and there's a more complicated thing where you can get the radial flows as well. So we have the full three components of the flow. And by choosing this geometry uh, carefully, it is a bit complicated. Uh, you can actually, it's sort of as if you've shot all these waves in, and they all coalesce at one point in the interior, and so you're directly, you have an image of the interior. And so we move this aperture all around the surface of the, dis or the disk of the sun, and so we have a map of, uh, of the flows. So uh, yeah, and so this sort of illustrates the uh, symmetry breaking. Uh, so the wave travel time from A to B is not the same. If it's not the same as the wave travel time from B to A, then there is a flow. So we test it. We test it. We take complex flows from, uh, from one of these ash simulations. We uh, shoot waves through it, and then we measure wave travel times, and we see that we can, so this is radial uh, flows in the radial direction, flows in the, in the latitudinal direction, flows in the longitudinal direction, and the travel time maps, which are in principle supposed to be representative of these flows, as you can see, are correlated with these things. And so if we, if we, were, to take, if we were to measure travel times on the sun, and they look like this, this would be a paper in nature. So, large-scale convection detected on the sun or something like this. Sadly, that is not the case. Uh, so this is a typical travel time map, of the, those, uh, those things that we measure. And it is essentially, for all practical purposes, uh, completely consistent with noise. Almost, almost completely consistent with noise. So there's some slight component that isn't. And so the measurement of, of what deviates from noise is uh, an estimate in some sense of what the properties of convection are uh, in the sun. So uh, it's a bit of a technical thing, so I won't describe that in detail. But uh, we do a great deal of statistical analysis, and we can place uh, stringent upper bounds on, on convective motions in the interior. So this is 28,000 kilometers. This curve, the red curve here, indicates uh, an upper bound. It's an upper bound on convective flows, 28,000 kilometers below the surface. Um, so this, the solar radius is 700,000 kilometers, so it's very fairly close to the surface. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a numerical simulation at roughly the same depth. On the vertical axis is velocity in meters per second, and the horizontal axis is spherical harmonic degree. So the upper bounds, seismic upper bounds, are nearly 100 times lower than, um, than numerical simulations. And this is just one, uh, I think other numerical simulations are, there are numerous other um, simulations at the moment, and I think they're comparable in some sense in terms of the velocity magnitude that they predict. And uh, so it's, um, if you were to estimate the Rosby number uh, of this, uh, it's uh, extremely small. Um, there are numerous curves, so forgive me, but let's say you were to take this, humor me again, I don't want to get into the details, but if you were to take one of these curves, you're looking at very, very small Rossby numbers on large scales. Perhaps this is unsurprising, but uh, I think numerical simulations would predict that the Rossby numbers are on the order of one or comparable to one. So, so this basically means that it's rotationally dominated convection. Um, so this has actually fairly profound implications, and uh, I'm quite delighted that uh, now this has started a conversation, at least in our community. 
The first and uh, the, the thing that I didn't know actually is that it's really, really hard to transport one solar luminosity outwards. For some reason, I mean, uh, for a very specific technical reasons that I, that, that I don't want to get into, it's remarkably hard to transport uh, to transport uh, you know thermal uh, the, the one solar luminosity, the unit of one solar heat essentially outwards, with very, very low kinetic energies. So this is actually an outstanding puzzle at the moment. But the more interesting and the more, uh, well, I don't know if it's the more, this is actually equally hard. And the other equally hard puzzle is how this near solid body rotation of the sun is sustained. Uh, if you listen to all the talks before, uh, they talked about uh, cylindrical, uh, the, you know, the Prudman-Taylor balance, essentially, which are cylindrical contours uh, parallel to the rotation axis. But that's really not the case. The contours of rotation are actually conical, in fact, almost radial. It's almost solid body. So if you were to plot the angular momentum distribution, angular momentum is very heavily concentrated at the equator, and there's almost no angular momentum at the pole. So this is actually quite puzzling, like how, how, this, is, how this is sustained, how this is, first of all, created, and why this is created, and then how this is sustained. So these mechanisms are not fully apparent yet. And uh, you know, the easier, the, not the, the, the only answer has been really that convective renal stresses support this uh, through, through some mechanism. But if the renal stresses, as predicted by the seismic results, are ten, uh, they're probably 10,000 times weaker than theory needs to sustain this. So this is a sort of a, uh, an extraordinary, you know, it's, a, it's just a puzzle. So uh, as I said, this is uh, starting to generate a conversation in, su in the sense that, you know, where, how is angular momentum transport in the sun? How is thermal transport achieved? And so if you were to look, uh, the interesting thing with the convective, so if you go back to the surface, all of the stuff that I was describing before was deeper within, within the sun. But if you go back to the surface and you were to look at the spectrum of convection, this is how it looks. Horizontal axis is wave number in spherical harmonic degree. Vertical axis is power. Um, and so you see this broad, broad spectrum. So this is where granulation sits. This is where the, you know, those little thermal transport of the sun happens. This is supergranulation, those really big structures. And so you see this peculiar thing. It's sort of roughly flat, and then rises, and then it drops with wave number. And so this drop in wave number is actually quite mysterious. Because if you were to do numerical simulations, and that's what these guys, Lord et al., have been doing, then this just keeps on rising as you go to lower and lower wave number. Uh, and this is what you would sort of naively expect even from turbulence calculations, that the, that the most power accumulates at the lowest wave numbers. So how that, how, why this asymptotically falls uh, at very low wave number is actually a question that, that is not known. And so these guys say that something is missing in a, in a dramatic statement at the end of their paper. Once again, I was delighted. Something is missing from our current theoretical understanding of solar convection below 10 megameters. So, um, so yeah, so uh, that's where this, uh, this stands at the moment. And I have one, my, one final speculation to offer. It's uh, very similar to some of the things that I've been hearing about the Earth. Um, so it's all, everything is essentially about descending plumes. Uh, as a, a very clever colleague of mine once said, uh, convection in the sun is about cooling from the top, not heating from the bottom. So all the drama in convection happens vis-a-vis -vis the sun. It happens because the cooling from the top is fairly, con it's the, the boundary layer on the top is very thin. All the dynamics is being driven by stuff that's happening at the top. So there are these extremely thin descending plumes and if they break up in the interior of the convection zone, then they result in large-scale, vigorous, convective, overturning motions. But if they don't break up, uh, then, then you have something very similar to what's happening in the perhaps in the mantle in the Earth. And uh, so, it, so, the, so the current uh, speculation, uh, it's not mine, this is the speculation of my colleagues, is that it's not convection, but it's actually magnetoconvection. So you have, uh, you have these descending plumes that are sheathed by magnetic fields. Uh, and uh, stabilized as a consequence. And so these things can make their way all the way down to the base of the convection zone. And so these ma so magnetism stabilizes these plumes. And it's almost like, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen these experiments with high parental number convection, but you have these, or even I think seismology of the Earth suggests that you have uh, material, seismic material, or you have material from you know, continental crust or whatever that falls all the way to the base of Earth's convection zone or uh, the mantle. So uh, that may well be happening. And if that happens, essentially the motions are very weak. There's no, there's no mixing, there's no overturning. So that would explain the low turbulent kinetic energy that the seismic results uh, are suggesting. But, uh, but two major problems exist. 
how do you transport heat and how do you sustain angular momentum, that angular momentum gradient? And once again, I just want to point out that these parameters are extraordinary, so numerical simulations cannot access this, at least within our lifetimes, perhaps. So on that note, thanks very much. Question or comments? Magneto conduction idea, is it sensible that, let's say, the interaction parameter, you know, are the Lorentz forces actually strong enough to damp turbulence? Do we, do we have any estimates? Because no. if not... Yeah, it's, uh, so his question was, can magnetism actually stabilize plumes? Uh, and do we have any estimates? And uh, the answer is, I, I don't think we do. Yeah, it's just speculation. <laughs>